As the late 1930s led inevitably toward World War, patriotic fervor grew in America. Part of that fervor included laws requiring schoolchildren to salute the American flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. But Jehovah's Witnesses refused to participate. They believed saluting the flag violated the commandment against graven images or likenesses. But in 1940, the Supreme Court held in the Gobitis case that a mandatory flag salute was constitutional. And that decision signaled open season against Jehovah's Witnesses. Their kingdom halls were burned down, often as police and firefighters watched. Jehovah's Witnesses were harassed, beaten, and run out of their homes. One sheriff, asked why he allowed such violence, replied, quote, They're traitors. The Supreme Court says so. Unquote. The press was outraged, and even First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt condemned the violence. After Gobitis, the West Virginia Board of Education enacted a mandatory flag salute rule. Refusal to participate constituted insubordination, which could result in a student's expulsion. Expelled children were considered unlawfully absent, subjecting them and their parents to penalties. Barnett and other Jehovah's Witnesses sued the Board of Education in federal court. Despite Gobitis, a three-judge district court panel enjoined the board from compelling Jehovah's Witness children to salute the flag. The Board of Education then appealed directly to the United States Supreme Court. The case asked the court to consider whether the First Amendment required the board to excuse Jehovah's Witnesses from the compulsory salute. But instead, the Supreme Court went further, holding that the First Amendment prohibits compelling anyone to salute the flag or recite the pledge. Justice Robert Jackson, who joined the court after Gobitis was decided, wrote the court's opinion. Jackson explained that government may censor ideas only if their expression constitutes a clear and present danger of an injury. Jackson reasoned that, if government power to censor expression is so limited, then government power to compel expression can only be justified by an even greater showing of danger. Since the freedom that Barnett claimed didn't interfere with anyone else's rights, the children's refusal to salute the flag wasn't a threat of any sort. The Gobitis majority had presumed that governments had the power to compel the salute and only considered whether Jehovah's Witnesses were entitled to an exception. But the Barnett Court determined that the First Amendment's expressive and religious freedoms made applicable to the states by the 14th Amendment prohibited the board from compelling expressions of national unity. Justice Jackson summarized the court's reasoning in a passage that still resonates today. Quote, If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. Unquote. With these words, the court overruled Gobitis, and affirmed the district court's injunction. Justices Black and Douglas joined the majority opinion, but also wrote a concurrence together. Both had voted with the Gobitis majority, but now wrote to explain their change of heart. Before, they'd been afraid to create a rigid bar against state regulation of conduct detrimental to the public welfare. However, they'd failed to appreciate just how much the compelled salute restricted religious freedom. The compelled salute was akin to a test oath, which they considered abhorrent in American society. Words uttered under coercion, they argued, don't prove loyalty to anything other than self-interest. Justice Murphy also concurred, noting that a compelled flag salute is nothing but an empty gesture, far outweighed by the value of protecting freedom of thought and expression. Justice Felix Frankfurter dissented, referring to his Jewish heritage as a member of, quote, the most vilified and persecuted minority in history, unquote, he sympathized with the Jehovah's Witnesses, but he was reluctant to strike down duly enacted laws. Frankfurter considered legislatures, as much as courts, to be responsible for protecting citizens' rights. The board's rule, authorized by the West Virginia legislature, didn't discriminate against any one faith, he argued. It applied equally to the Jehovah's Witnesses as to all other faiths, Therefore, the law didn't violate the First Amendment's religion clauses. Justices Owen Roberts and Stanley Reed also dissented, asserting that Gobitis was correctly decided. Barnett was decided in the 1940s, but it remains a cornerstone of First Amendment jurisprudence. 
Through many tumultuous periods in United States history, Justice Jackson's inspirational language has stood the test of time, acting as a guiding light to a free and democratic society.